when I was probably uh, 13 or 14, I, uh, I saw a band of brothers and I thought that was like the coolest thing ever. And that was about paratroopers and that was about D-Day and everything and how interesting. But little did I know that the uh, United States Army had uh, not only made uh, one or two, but uh, nearly, uh, I think it was five parachute drops you know, into combat before D-Day. I mean, nobody really talks about that. So the hunt began because I think people who are interested in history are always interested in the origin story. So the hunt began for, you know, where was the first combat parachute jump made? Not in training, not, you know, where nobody's shooting at you, but the actual first combat parachute jump. And I mean, it makes sense in retrospect, but at the time it was like a big mystery. And, um, you know, the internet really didn't have any information on it. And um, in the old internet where, you know, nothing but obscure chat rooms and uh, phone catalogs. I don't know. Anyways, I'm not that old, but uh, I had trouble finding any information. And then slowly I learned bits and pieces about some kind of parachute drop that had been made in North Africa, something that happened there in the deserts of Algeria. And I was really interested. What, what did that look like? What was that story? And the absence of information um, really enticed me. So to make a long story short, uh, the US Army's first combat parachute jump was in Algeria. And they made two more, actually, before the North African campaign was over with. For the most part, people, as a collective culture, we don't know about this. And people who claim themselves to be military historians don't know about it. Um, and I think that's, well, it's unfortunately quite a shame because some of this stuff's just outlandish. I mean, when you really dig into the details of this, it's like, okay, it's hard to believe unless you're actually reading it from a history book. So we'll get there. But the story really starts with why was uh, World War II in North Africa in the first place? And it really begins and ends with this fellow named Benito Mussolini. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm really trying to steer away from any kind of tropes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a wide berth here uh, from any kind of modern day po politics. Um, because uh, what I do isn't political, but Mussolini had this idea that in the past, Italy was great, and he was on a mission to make Italy great again. And he, um, he did some things, and he invaded Ethiopia. He established colonies throughout East Africa, Somalia, um, used mustard gas on people in Ethiopia in the 30s, which was... Uh, is disturbing and little talked about. Um, and I think since our culture is mainly dominated by West, uh, Western white history, uh, we don't really talk about the fact that mustard gas was used in Ethiopia, but regardless it was. So Mussolini actually built a series of colonies in the new Italian empire in North Africa. And he actually butted his forces um, right up against uh, English controlled Egypt. So. 1940, May 10th of 1940 to be exact, Italy declared war on England in solidarity, in solidarity with uh, the Nazis. And um, well, the, the English didn't wait around because they actually started whipping the hell out of the Italians in Northern Africa uh, relatively quickly. They didn't wait. They uh, quite frankly started just destroying the Italian troops. Apparently the English army is a little bit more difficult to fight than the uh, Ethiopian army. Um, because it turns out the English had things like airplanes um, and tanks and artillery. So it became very apparent very quickly that uh, Northern Africa and the whole real focus is the Suez Canal and enter the, the wonderful song by Toto. Um, the Suez Canal is right here and this was uh, just a massive arterial link between you know India English col or English colonies in India etc off in the far east anything you had to move it through the Suez Canal so Mussolini thought well let, let's contest the English in Egypt you know and just take this whole area well that didn't work out because the English struck first and they really started whipping their asses they destroyed an entire army group and uh, it became apparent very quickly that what Hitler thought because Hitler was really the one pulling the strings on everything um, 
he, he realized really quickly his ally who was holding this very vital part of the world was about to get his ass handed to him. Um, and, and very quickly that was going to change for the worse from, from, from Hitler's point of view. So he sent a German detachment, now we now know as the Africa Corps, down there to prop up the Italian troops. And that is how World War II came to Africa. Now, that's the first part of it. Why was World War II in Africa? The second part of it is why were U.S. paratroopers ever in Africa? And that brings the broader question as to why was America ever in Africa during the Second World War? Well, that story really starts, uh, well, it directly starts in November of 1942 when uh, the Americans actually stepped foot in North Africa. And that was because Stalin had been making personal appeals to Roosevelt because um, Stalin personally found Roosevelt to be much more uh, agreeable than Churchill when it came to trying to persuade him to do things for him. Um, Stalin had a, a, a really great way of uh, asking for things and uh, not giving back a whole lot. Churchill was privy to this, but Roosevelt was so steeped in trying to keep Stalin happy that he was willing to agree to things. And before anybody was really ready to do it, Roosevelt uh, pledged to create a, quote, second front to help Stalin, because at this point, um, the Red Army was, was, was holding back the German army with you know, pretty much both hands and both of their feet and somehow trying to stand. And their Herculean efforts uh, were really transpiring at this point in this place called Stalingrad. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it, but it's kind of odd to think that a place as far as Stalingrad in the, in the USSR on the Volga River um, were going to influence events that happened as far as North Africa, but that's the thing about a world war. It's all interconnected. So Stalin was not sure he could really win the battle at Stalingrad. He had stopped the Germans, but what he really needed was... Um, a diversion, something to take pressure off of what was happening in the East. So Roosevelt, in one of the meetings, said, sure, Stalin, I will get you your second front. And uh, after he had said that, the cat was somewhat out of the bag, and then plans began. And it was determined that the soft underbelly of uh, the uh, Third Reich, so to speak, of, of, of Nazi Germany was the Mediterranean, Churchill, and Roosevelt came to agreement that if they're going to go somewhere, they should probably attack the Mediterranean first. So it was thought, let's go to North Africa. So that's how the U.S. got involved in North Africa. So I've kind of introduced some of these concepts, some of these things. We've contextualized where we are in the world and why. It's time to start introducing some characters. Like any great story, and I told you if there's anything I could go on forever about, this might be it. There are amazing characters. An indica sativa blend I smell, mm. but they're all blends now, don't be fooled. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, so I want to introduce you guys to the 2nd Battalion, 503rd Parachute Infantry Battalion, which is a word and number salad. 2nd Battalion of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Battalion was, uh, or 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment was activated um, at Fort Benning. Uh, in 1942, when the U.S. Army realized, well, we might need these things called paratroopers because uh, paratroopers had taken vital places in Belgium and in France during Blitzkrieg and then also took an entire island by themselves. And these are all German paratroopers, by the way. This island was called Crete. And when in German paratroopers single-handedly took an entire heavily defended island, the West really kind of took note, and I mean the Allied West. So... Um, they thought, we really need some paratroopers of our own. So frantic development began. And uh, the 2nd Battalion of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment was literally one of the first fully manned, fully equipped battalions. If you don't understand, and this is fine because I'm crazy enough to understand it and memorize it, it goes something like this, battalion, regiment, division. There's like three or, three or four battalions in three or four regiments of a division. So they were doing their best to create divisions of these paratroopers. But by this point in the war, Roosevelt's starting to promise things. We don't have a division of paratroopers yet. What are we going to do? Well, 
we better send something over to England to get ready because we're promising the second front. Well, all we really had was a single battalion of guys. There were a couple battalions that were fully equipped, but it's time to introduce another character and what a character he is in the form of Major Edson Raff. Edson Raff's an interesting dude. I have his memoir. I think you gave it to me at one Christmas. These are the kind of Christmas presents I ask for, by the way. It's like, I want this obscure single printing memoir. But it's an, he's an interesting dude. And uh, just to introduce Edson Raff, he commanded the 2nd Battalion, 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment. Um, I can say that many times very quickly. And he um, was just a spitfire. He was just an insane dude. He would just get in screaming matches with anybody who said that his battalion wasn't the best battalion there was, hands down. Just, he was like fanatical about training, about being the best, and about, you know, if they were ever going to get into combat, his battalion not only would be the first ones there, they would win the engagement. So Edson Raff's an interesting dude, and his memoir was pushed out in 1944 for obvious reasons. He was recalled back from D-Day, actually, where he was commanding troops, to write a memoir to help sell war bonds. So he became the U.S. Army's poster boy in a way, and this is obvious why. Edson Raff was nicknamed Little Caesar by his troops, and he was just a hard charger. I cannot, this guy is a character. He is just nuts. He would just march his people until they started to pass out and then he'd yell at them until they got up. He was, you know, he was really hated by a lot of his people, but at the same time, he was always right there next to them doing it. So that was kind of an espirit de corps. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't off on the side while his, other, while his people were doing things. So it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. They really loved him and they really hated him and they called him Little Caesar behind his back, not to his face, because that wouldn't have ended well. This guy was probably about five foot tall, by the way. Um, this is a quote I have for you guys on Edson Raff. His second in command said he had a temper as bad as a wet hen. I don't know what wet hens do. Some of you may, but that's funny and it's very 1940s. So that's a good way to kind of think of it. Little Edson Raff running around. I don't know. Um, so obviously when it came point where Roosevelt is saying things like, yeah, Stalin will give you your second front. And the army, meanwhile, because the commander-in-chief is promising things, thinks, well, who the hell are we going to send? Well, Edson Raff, it just so happens, has the highest trained, best parachute infantry battalion that exists in the United States at this time. So these are the very first airborne infantry that are sent overseas. They're sent overseas in the fabled Queen Mary, which has been retrofitted to a troop ship. And I was going to get into details because Edson Raff got into a screaming match with one of the people on the ship, but time is of the essence. They end up in England. They cross train. Um, a lot of like press events are going on at this time because we're trying to buck up our people because quite frankly, things aren't going very well. Um, you know, the Japanese are ruling in the Pacific. The Germans are unchallenged and unmatched in the West. So um, propaganda is necessary to make people think that it's possible to win this war because they don't know. So um, they hear that there's these really elite, really fancy, really tough guys training over in England. They're the first paratroopers. Paratroopers sell war bonds. The first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, visits them. There's incredible photographs taken by her press corps that still exist today of her meeting these guys um, and Edson Raff. Um, I think, I believe uh, Churchill met them, the Queen met them. It was a big hoop de doo and they became honorary members of the English paratroop force, and they wore their special maroon beret, and I think they were the first American infantry to ever wear a beret, and now everybody has a beret in the U.S. Army. So, um, Time to introduce another character into our story. We're talking about Major William Yarborough. Yarborough was an interesting dude. He was one of the first guys who uh, jumped out of an airplane for the U.S. Army in the U.S. Army parachute test platoon that was occurring right after we realized we need these things called paratroopers. He developed parachute, the, the paratrooper boots. He developed their insignia. He developed their uniforms. He developed the paratroopers in many ways. So he was sent to England and was kind of operating as an advisor and uh, was pretty much getting ready to invade France in 1942, 1943, because this second front needs to happen, right? We, we need to do it. You know, the boss said we're going to do it, so we need to do it. Um, so he was, he was around, and then 
plans got shifted and we started thinking, well, maybe the second front, if it has to happen somewhere, maybe we could have it happen where there are less German troops, where it's a little bit easier. Ah, North Africa. Behold, my beautiful drawing, the ocean, the land, the majesty. This is Algeria and this is Tunisia. So, and this is where we're looking at right here. And this is also supposed to be Africa. Again, Toto's lovely ballad. Covered by Weezer, listen to that. It's really, it's, it, I don't like covers that much, but that was good. So the idea was to hit Africa here and open this second front. So that's kind of a good compromise. We need a second front, but we're not quite ready to hit Normandy yet. I mean, God, in 1944, if you were here at my previous talk, we, it wasn't certain whether or not we were going to get the D-Day beaches in 1944. And that was after two years of combat experience, or one year, a little bit over one year of full combat experience in Normandy, and we still almost didn't have it. Here we had no combat experience, completely untested army, so let's not go to Normandy just yet. All right, let's hit Africa. So Yarborough is hearing these talks, and he gets in cahoots with the general that was put in command of this proposed North Africa invasion, Operation Torch. Ooh, I love code names. They're so much fun. Operation Torch. Um, and Yarborough and General Clark, who's in charge of this thing, he's underneath the Supreme Command. Uh, Supreme Commander Eisenhower is giving it to General Clark, and General Clark's planning it. And Yarborough knows Clark because he's been palling around in London. And Yarborough says, you know, it might be a good idea to use some paratroopers. You know, there's a couple air bases just behind the invasion beaches that you guys are thinking about. And if the French take off fighter planes to strafe the hell out of our guys and our troop ships unloading people onto the North African coast, that would be a real problem. This is a perfect opportunity for us to use these guys, and I know just who we could use. There's this hard charger, Edson Raff, they call him Little Caesar, don't say that to his face, but we could use them. He could capture these air bases. It would be perfect. It would be a great way to test it. The only problem is well, we didn't know what the French were going to do when we hit North Africa. There were actually two plans once we committed to the North African invasion because France was invaded by the Germans and technically the French government was the Vichy government, which was based out of Vichy France. Hence the uh, uh, wonderful correlation there. I wonder if it has to do with Vichy and brainwaves. Anyways, so we didn't know what the hell they were going to do, these French people hanging out in North Africa. And we were actually planning on landing in places where there were less, less Germans. The Germans were fighting the English over here in Egypt and Libya. So we were actually going to land over here in French North Africa, Morocco, Algeria. So there were two plans. They're either going to fight us or they're not. Plan war, plan peace. Coincidental. So we didn't know what was going to happen, but we knew that if the French were to take off airplanes from these air bases, it would not go well. So, just in case, the plan was made to fly these airborne guys, these only paratroopers we had, to drop them. It was going to be something like a 1,500-mile flight. It's like 10 hours or something in an unpressurized C-47 cargo plane. Um, no radar. We didn't have no radar in these airplanes. It was celestial navigation. Ooh, high tech. So you're navigating by the stars, 1,500 miles, down around France, across Spain, over Morocco, and then you're there. Piece of cake, right? Well, there weren't enough maps. There weren't enough celestial navigation equipment. As a matter of fact, uh, there was only one celestial navigation device per every four aircraft. There was only one map for every flight leader, of which there was like five planes, to a flight, I believe, or maybe it was three. Uh, I'm not an Air Force guy. But you're starting to understand, and oh, and by the way, these airplane pilots, while these paratroopers have been training like mad under this madman, Edson Rath, you know, these airplane pilots had never really done a long distance aircraft flight before. Well, they'd flown to Ireland for fun. It's a fun place. Um, but they had never flown 1,500 miles. So, Cracks are starting to appear. And also, how the hell are they going to get there? They, they don't have radar. They have this celestial navigation. Well, there was this device, this, this beautiful device called Eureka. 
If you're into World War II military history, you might have heard of Pathfinders. Well, Pathfinders are famous for taking, essentially in World War II, the pathfinding uh, equipment was you had a radio beacon it transmitted on frequency, and you had a receiver beacon in your airplane, and you can tell when you're getting closer to it. High-tech stuff for 1943, 1942. So the idea became, well, what if we somehow got a Eureka beacon at this airfield behind the landing sites at Oran, there were two airfields that the French could potentially use if Plan War was in effect. La Seine, you speak French, you know, I don't know. And uh, Tarfori, the French people are just screaming right now. They're just, they're just screaming. Um, and that's fine, they can do that. But anyways, the idea was to somehow get a radio beacon there. How the hell are we gonna do it? Well, again, I'm told you this stuff's crazy. There was this guy, he was in England. It was just like a cast of characters. Oh, who's who, there's this guy in England. His name was Lieutenant Norman Hapgood. He was a Signal Corps radio expert. And he was there in England being trained by the English on this new invention called Eureka Rebecca Receiver Transmitter Pathfinding Equipment. He was learning about it and he was gonna bring examples and knowledge back to the States so he could teach people about it. Well, they said, no, you're here. We're gonna give you fake State Department credentials, dress you up as a civilian, we're going to put this Eureka Re Rebecca thing in two big brown suitcases. We're going to send you to Algeria with some fake State Department reason. And somehow you are going to go to the airfield these guys are supposed to land to in the middle of the night, the night before November the 8th, which was the day that they're going to be jumping on them after their 1,500 mile, 10 hour flight. And you're going to set all this up and you're going to meet the French or the Algerian underground and they're going to help you. Well, I, I, it's really, I there's so many crazy details, but it's funny that Yarborough, the guy who came up with the paratroopers and he was in, in London and, and, and was kind of helped create this whole thing by saying, I know the paratroopers to use, we should use paratroopers. Well, he was actually pretty savage discuss, discussing this Norman Hapgood guy. He said he was like paled by fluorescent light. It's pretty much like this army guy, this paratrooper guy discussing a nerd. That's, that's really how it comes across. I've read Yarborough's memoir, and it's not, not pretty, but this is who they're sending. So you can kind of imagine they're sending this dude, you know, it's like, you're not even here for this, you know. Um, we're sending this nerd in. We're sending in the nerds. But it's okay, because he actually completes his mission. And we can get to that in a minute. So it turns out they're going to do it. They're going to go, they're going to invade, and they're sending um, these paratroopers in. So... I told you they didn't have enough maps. They didn't have radar. Well, there was a failsafe. There was a failsafe. Thank God for the failsafe. There was a British ship. And it was transmitting on a radio frequency. It was like 440 megahertz or whatever. I don't know radios. It was 440 something. Some capital and lowercase letters afterwards. Some Vern would know, yeah. But um, anyways. This ship was transmitting a beacon and it was off the coast in a holding pattern. And they were gonna fly in on that. It was just so many things that could go wrong. You know, that's one thing, you know. It's like Occam's razor, the simplest answer is the best. Well, this was complex. And if any one part of it really fell apart and it was all really could have, then you're in trouble. Well, the ship started, was actually transmitting on the wrong beacon. And they were actually the ones, this ship was gonna be the ones that were gonna tell them whether or not it was plan peace or plan war. So not only were they going into no, they're just completely dead air, they had nothing to home in on. And did I mention the Eureka beacon that Mr. Hapgood was bringing only had a 20 mile radius? So that's not even like, so that's maybe like, you know, you, you get 99% of the way done with your flight where you could be hundreds of miles off course and then maybe you can pick up this, you know, it's not gonna work. And the ship's transmitting on the wrong signal so they're not in the right place. They're not getting told that it's plan war, or plan peace. By the way, it's plan war because the Vichy French have decided to fight. They don't know what the hell's gonna happen. And uh, Edson Raff, these, and the problem is, is when you're flying at 10,000 feet and you don't have oxygen, none of these guys had oxygen. They had blankets. They thought of that. They gave these guys blankets. These guys didn't have any oxygen, so they start going to sleep. And that's fine, they're not dying, but they're drowsy they're going to sleep so all these guys are asleep and Yarborough writes in his memoirs I woke up at one point and I saw one of the pilots taking a celestial 
reading. So I was like, oh, everything's cool. and went back to sleep. Oh, well, when they woke up in the morning of November the 8th, they're supposed to be jumping. Planes are, planes have landed in Spain, neutral Spain. They've been captured by the Spanish government and interned. Planes uh, are all over the place. Edson Raff has less than half a dozen planes with him now. He's in command of the whole damn thing and he's looking out the windows and there's just a few aircraft around. They, this is insane. Um, it just keeps getting better, doesn't it? Edson Raff, they realize that the pilot starts circling and that's his classic. They don't know where the hell they are. Let's wait till the end. Let's wait till the end. I see you, you did this last time, that's okay. Um, they're, they're circling, they don't know where the hell they are. They're just over the desert. Well, they see some huts. So one of the pilots thinks, well, let's stop and ask for directions. I'm serious. A plane lands, the pilot gets out, asks the Arabs who are there, one of them speaks French, where the hell are we? They say, well, you're about 100 miles away where you're supposed to be. So Edson Raff gets back in and they all go. And by the time we get there, there's aircraft landed everywhere. There's a big salt flat outside of the aerodrome they're supposed to be taking. And it's just, they're lucky because even though the Vichy French government said that they're going to fight it out and resist the invasion, a lot of the local French people who are actually there didn't want to shoot the Americans. And this is one of the reasons the Americans were going in. I have a, a jump jacket, a parachute jump jacket that I put together like what one of these guys would have had. It has a nice, big, beautiful American flag sewn on the shoulder because they knew long-standing British-French rivalry might mean that these French who are on the knife's edge of either fighting or not might start shooting British people, but maybe not Americans. So they put them big old American flags on all these guys, and a lot of the French didn't fight, but some of them did. So it turns out that was the very first parachute operation in American military history. And... Uh, it's, it's just wild. I mean, there's even more. I've had to cut this down because we're gonna have to end in about five minutes here if we're gonna have any time for questions, and I know there are questions. But essentially what happens is they land here, and Edson Raff is circling, waiting to land, and Edson Raff's insane. I mean, he's Little Caesar. He sees tanks down there, and he thinks they're enemy tanks. So he says, let's get them. So he has the planes form up, and they do a jump, perfect jump. I'll be only about 80 guys are now with Edson Raff. The rest of them are scattered around everywhere. And they jump and they parachute out with the intent on fighting these tanks. Turns out they're American tanks. Thank God. It was so balled up. Can you imagine if we, if we hit Normandy like this? No, no way. So anyways, we're lucky because most of the French people didn't want to, didn't want to fight back. Some of them did. As a matter of fact, the paratroopers were strafed by a couple lone French fighter planes um, and uh, one of the paratroopers was killed. His name was Tommy McCall. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of McCall um, Army Base. It's a big place for training paratroopers even today, named after Tommy McCall. So that's part of the legacy of this and people don't know. So another really interesting thing that I'm going to quickly touch on is the second and third parachute jumps that this battalion actually made. And it, like, nobody knows about any of it. And it's not, they didn't just make one jump, they made three. The second jump they made was just a complete, it was just, it was an all out rat race because the Americans showed up where the Germans didn't expect them and the invasion caught them off guard and it became a race to start capturing airfields because now we're gonna use my map, my beautiful map. The Americans are just pouring in here. People landed at Algiers, people landed at Iran and people landed at Morocco further down here. And we're all sweeping in towards Tunisia because there's quite a few Germans up here and there's uh, vital ports here and here because Sicily's just right over here. Italy's right over here. So there's tons of supplies coming in to wreak havoc on the Western desert war against the British. So it's imperative that the Americans who landed up here swing and start to cut off all these Germans up here. Well, the Germans don't want that to happen because that would be an absolute, it would be a disaster for them. But they're starting to learn things. And I mean, it's hilarious because Mike, you gave me uh, two maps of North Africa. That w One was an American Army issue map. This is what they would have had when they landed on the beaches. And another one was captured off of a German. Needless to say, the German map is so much more detailed. Well, what's hilarious is the Americans didn't even know 
half of the landmarks, half of the vital tactical things that were here, and we were supposed to be moving quickly to, get, to grab up these vital road junctions and airports and things the Germans could be using because all of a sudden we're there. It's a race for all these tactical places. Edson Raff gets orders. He gets orders to, uh, you know, essentially make another paratroop drop pronto on an uh, airbase that's somewhere over here, somewhere over here, and to deny that to the Germans. Because as soon as you have airplanes here, you can start hitting these coastal ports, and you can start hitting all the roads that all those supplies and men are coming into the fight. So these airports in the middle of the desert sea are important. So RAF, you and whatever paratroopers you can put together, um, they really didn't have a lot of para parachutes at this point because they used them, uh, you need to go jump now. So Raf is planning this, and he's, and he's like, God, usually it takes weeks to put together a, a big parachute jump, and I have five days. Well, he's talking to two French pilots, and he's talking to them, yeah, we're going to be jumping on this place, and they say, yeah, that, there's no airport there. It's actually over here. And in pencil, they drew on the map this little place called, U oh, the French are crying again, Eux les Bains, over here in the middle of uh, Algeria, right on the border of uh, Tunisia. And apparently there's an airfield there. The map, Mike, the American map does not have that airport on it. The German map does. So we, don't, we didn't even know that was there. And Edson Raff just was talking to two French pilots who had just come from there and said, yeah, we flew over an airbase, man. That's where you should be going. So they went there. They jumped on it, second jump. Shortly after that, oh, we're doing good. We're almost done. So shortly after that, there's enough allied forces, a battle is starting to develop, um, the American forces are moving in and moving towards the coast, and the Germans are piling up forces over here through the coastal ports. Well, there's this bridge, and apparently reconnaissance found that there's a bridge that's a railroad bridge, and it's over this canyon, and, and it's moving a lot of material, a lot of vital stuff. It's an arterial connection from the coastal ports to the interior where the battle's happening. Well, what are we going to do at this bridge? Well, it's too, it's too hidden in this canyon to hit with airplanes. The idea is to get 30 paratroopers, fly them in, drop them. The paratroopers will load this thing full of dynamite, blow it sky high, escape into the desert, be picked up by airplanes that have landed for them and take them off. So you know, James Bond, they don't have radar. They don't have maps that show them where the hell anything is. Edson Raff doesn't learn about this. The commander doesn't learn about it before days before it was supposed to happen, in which case he gets a fighter pilot who just flew sorties over there to actually ride shotgun with, uh, you know, one of the pilots to try to get there. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, quote, they knew it was a suicide mission. The good, idea, the good idea fairy from somebody who doesn't understand parachute operations and the things you need to do to sustain them came up with this good idea, the good idea fairy. Like the tooth fairy, they only come in the night. Well, nobody's looking. Wait. Anyways, there's another period of it. Um, the most easily to be replaced kind of people, quote, are to be found and scooped up for this because they know they're not coming back. Well, there's a guy who's fresh on the boat bringing some gear in the rear back from England named Lieutenant Dan DeLeo. And they say, Dan, I'm glad you're here. We got a mission for you. They send him and 28 other poor schmucks. Eight of them come back. And it was two weeks and 120 miles on foot and under a tarp in the back of an Italian truck. At one point, they drove through a marching German column, and they're all hiding under a tarp, that Dan brings his small group of six guys back because it was just a suicide mission. They jumped in the wrong place. They ended up 22 miles from where they were supposed to be. They put 500 pounds of TNT they'd been lugging around on some railroad tracks and blew that sky high, thinking they'd do something, and they were tired of lugging around the TNT. So that was the third drop they made, the L Gem Raid. So it's really interesting. I love telling people about this North African paratroop odyssey because a lot of things come from it. First of all, we're defining in real time and unfortunately with lives the role paratroopers would serve later on and ultimately the special forces. The, the, the kinds of people um, who, who took out Osama bin Laden could never have done what they did without formative experiences like this. We also learn the limits of paratroopers. You can't just drop 30 guys and, you know, 120 miles behind enemy lines and expect that to go well. 
We also learned that you need these things called pathfinders. These guys who jump in first before everybody else. They're trained, they're military, and they set up the beacon equipment. You can't have the geek squad going in there with an attache case and some phony State Department story. We also learned you needed to train your pilots just as much as you train your ground troops because you can't get there unless the pilots know what they're doing. And, and finally, it's just such incredible stories. I'm telling you, I could go on forever about this. There's stuff I left out I'd love to tell you guys, but um, we, yeah, we'll get there. It's just wild stories. You know, guys did this, um, and I find that really incredible. It's like, it's like Indiana Jones on steroids. You know, Indiana Jones parachuting in to blow up a bridge with 500 pounds of TNT. Like, this is crazy. It's amazing. If anything, it's, it's interesting. So I appreciate you guys coming here. We had to cut it a little short, but I appreciate you guys coming. This was really fun, at least for me. Maybe it was just absolutely awful for you guys. But you're very polite if it was. You're very polite if it was. Questions anybody, because this was wild stuff. On that one, uh, the El Gem raid, full combat equipment, um, water, helmet, ammunition. Um, you're next. We'll start a queue like Mr. Reinhold did in his uh, philosophy class. We, are, we got so rowdy, we'd have like 20 and then he'd cut it off. Um, they carried a full combat load and a shitload of demo equipment. 100, 100 pounds, give or take. 100 pounds, give or take. Mother, sweet mother. Yeah. They, just were they didn't know. So they were. So your the question was. So the people on the very first drop were just lost and they got scattered. Ever guys ended up in Spain. They were interned there for months and then eventually the right. Spanish thought, all right, go along, you little Americans. We're tired of feeding you. Um, they were. They landed all over the place. There's a big old salt flat out here that a bunch of planes kind of found because it was so huge and they landed there on the salt flat. Um, they were scattered all over the place. The, I have the numbers written down. It was something like only 83 guys out of the entire uh, battalion were still with their commander by the time they reached there. So how big the battalion? About 300, 400 guys. Excuse me, it was, I think it was 83 missing. There were 83 missing like Almost a month later, they still didn't know where the hell 83 guys were. 83 missing from that first jump. Denisimo. Whatever happened to Little Caesar? Little Caesar? <laughs> he opened a pizza, pizza power. <laughs> you know, he didn't start a pizza company. Little Caesar went on to, um, he got promoted because he was, he was a baller. He was just in, insane and just incredibly driven. He got promoted. He ended up leading an entire task force later in this campaign. We, another thing that this really tells us by studying this history is that um, the popular narrative around American involvement in North Africa was that we, we people know about Kasserine Pass where we just got the ever loving crap blown out of us by the Africa Corps the first time we really came in contact with the Africa Corps. And it's quite a shameful thing for American military history. It was necessary, but well, before that ever happened, Little Caesar ended up he ended up running this thing called the Tunisian Task Force, which was some of the first American troops in Tunisia. And they drove so far and close to the coast that they had to tell him to stop. He had, he had opened the back door. There just weren't the resources there to support him. He was incredibly aggressive. He led forces on D-Day. Shortly after D-Day, they put him in. He was in charge of a tank task force. They said, you did it once before, you can do it again. And coincidentally enough, he led men in the first combat jump of the Second World War, and he led men in the, in the last. He ended up commanding the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment that jumped into Germany in 1945. So he survived the war? Yes, he did. Excellent. Martin. Yeah, you said uh, it was one battalion that jumped into Africa on the first jump. Of that battalion, the three to 400 people, how many of them died and how many of them died? There was, they, uh, there was uh, aircraft strafed them, killed four guys, wounded a few more. And then they fought in Tunisia. I believe it was 15 men, 
There was right around 15 men wounded and less than 10 killed. But 83 of them were just either interned in Spain or lost somewhere. Some guys, they, you know, they had to, you know, barter with Arab dudes to get led back to the friendly lines. Some of them were taken prisoner. They were scattered everywhere. So they were combat ineffective nearly. And it was amazing that they continued on and made another jump at Uxles Baines almost immediately afterwards. It was just wild. But that's the best numbers I can give you right now. Yes, Chris. Yeah. Is that literally paratroopers or figuratively paratroopers? Um, both. Both. Half of them had to be driven there by bus, I do believe, um, if I remember correctly. The other half had to get there so fast. The, the, the race was so intense for these airfields on the border of Tunisia that the English, I believe it was the 3rd Parachute Infantry Regiment, the English paratroopers were there as well. And they were actually ordered to do a similar mission where they were sent to fly to this coastal port called Bone. And it has like a little asterisk chevron thing over the O, so I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, I'm looking at my sister because you studied in France, so maybe you can help. But, but I'm not getting any lifelines, that's fine. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll drown in the French language. I'm okay with it. I'm American. It's part of my duty. Um, duty to God and country to butcher their language. Anyways, um, the British were flying to Bone to capture this airfield. And about on the horizon, there were German planes full of German paratroopers coming to take the same place and the British sped up and dumped out in front of the German paratroopers and they saw that happening because once you get people on the ground they're just going to shoot you before you can get your guns up so the Germans just went day late and a dollar short that day so that's how intense it was so they were very short on parachutes they were supposed to get another they, they had requested parachutes be shipped over from England with everything else that was coming from England and it was just a needle in the haystack. They didn't know when those parachutes were gonna reach them and parachutes get damaged on landing and they take special guys who know what they're doing to repack them. And if you get dirt and rocks and things in there, you can't just repack them on the ground because you'll tear open the silk. And it, they were running low on parachutes. Funny story, I and I have many. We are at four minutes. So funny story time. There was actually a parachute shortage throughout the entire uh, Mediterranean campaign because it, they finally were able to put together a division. The 82nd Airborne Division came over and positioned themselves up here after they'd captured North Africa. And they had put all their parachutes in a hangar. And that's where the parachutes were. That's where they packed them. That's where they serviced them. And a German bomber came over one day and dropped a bomb, one bomb, and it blew up that hangar. So they actually were jumping into Sicily shortly after that and they said we need parachutes so bad they just went and took a bunch from the Air Force. So you see really interesting photographs where these guys are using parachutes that just are not standard. But that's like far down the weeds of how much I am into early parachute stuff because I can tell what kind of parachute you're wearing in a grainy black and white photograph. And this is why I was single for years. Anyways, <laughs> any other any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Little Caesar and his Tunisian task force drove such a spike, and they 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 took this place called Gafsa, which was severely hampering the Germans' flank. The Germans committed Panzers. They redirected Panzers to get Little Caesar's little Tunisian task force. So yeah, he definitely redirected. He definitely redirected uh, some some assets that way, but. Later on, after all of this, they actually, he did so well, they said, okay, we're going to hand this over to the French forces. You guys come back and get some rest. Well, the Germans came back, and this thing called Kasserine Pass happened. And, uh, well, that's what predominates the historical narrative, the, the failure at Kasserine Pass. But quite frankly, their American troops performed incredibly well for their first time in combat when they were adequately led by a guy like Edson Rath. Did you have a question, Mariah? You're making eyes. Seven, seven, fourteen. Last question. I can take requests. What was the timeline from when they landed in '93 for the first jump to them getting to Tunisia? And if what if it was so short, were they getting resupplied as they went? The idea being that they took the airbase and the boat came into the land. 
Resources were always an issue. They had a lot of French rations, a lot of French hot food, because they met up with the French Foreign Legion. They were made honorary foreign legionnaires, by the way, which is amazing. They're the only American military unit that's ever had that happen. And honorary French, British paratroopers to boot. This is incredible people in terms of battle honors. But uh, resources were already always an issue, just like that parachute. But they got really close with the French. And the Tunisian task force worked really closely with the Chasseurs d'Afrique, eh? That was, okay, okay, I got the nod of approval from my sister. Um, they, they worked closely with the French, so the French helped alleviate that with local supply channels. But I can't go any further, the boys over there are spinning up. What was their time on? Oh. Um, years? Oh, no, it was like weeks. They landed on the 8th, and by the 12th, they made the second jump here. And then within a matter of weeks, they were pulled back off the line. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I see them over there.